This video was made possible by Squarespace. Hi guys, welcome to Amateur Chemistry. So, all of us probably know that there are certain things that really shouldn't be mixed and by far the most famous example of this is of course ammonia and bleach. That's because they are both useful cleaning supplies found in almost every household and mixing them creates some particularly nasty things. Most of us are led to believe that the product of making this forbidden cocktail is the infamous mustard gas, which fortunately is a completely unrelated thing that isn't actually a gas. This however doesn't mean that mixing bleach and ammonia is something that you should do, because doing so creates a whole spectrum of fun compounds ranging from an incredibly toxic gas to an oily liquid that explodes upon the lightest touch. The reactions that produce these interesting molecules are quite unique, and apart from having the potential to end your life, turn out to have some incredibly useful properties. One of those properties is opening up a way to synthesize one of the most infamous rocket fuels, which is this simple looking molecule called hydrazine. Structurally, it resembles two ammonia molecules joined together and has some really terrifying properties. When pure, it is stupendously toxic, can easily form an explosive mixture with air, and paired with it being really corrosive and mutagenic, in my opinion, it's one of the worst compounds there are. For me, that's reason enough to make it, but despite being so horrible, it actually has thousands of useful applications in nearly every branch of chemistry and makes some beautiful and interesting reactions possible. To recreate those reactions for myself, I set out on a journey to create some hydrazine using only household cleaning supplies. However, first I would really like to tell you about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one advanced website creation platform designed to allow entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Using it, you can easily create incredible websites whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand and use them to sell anything or promote your business. Squarespace gives you access to amazing features like their Fluid Engine which boosts your creativity with its innovative drag and drop technology, allowing you to effortlessly create detailed and professional websites for your business regardless of your level of experience, which in my opinion is just awesome. In addition, Squarespace provides you with their new option for selling your own online courses, as well as access to their sophisticated analytics tools that let you oversee every detail of your site, and make optimizing your business easier than ever before. For a free trial, go to squarespace.com and when you're ready to launch, head to squarespace.com slash amateurchemistry to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Anyway, before beginning to make rocket fuel from cleaning supplies, I first have to take a lot of safety precautions, since I want to live long enough to publish this video, and the most important one is working in a good fume hood to suck all the nasty hydrazine fumes outside. Another very important thing for me is wearing gloves and safety goggles at all times to minimize any potential exposure to hydrazine and even with all the safety gear, I still felt quite nervous about making something so dangerous. Hydrazine is one of those infamous chemicals that chemists are unanimously scared to work with and while sometimes a grudge like this isn't well justified, here it's more than necessary. Anyway, with the safety aspect out of the way, I now have to decide which type of hydrazine I want to make, since this crazy molecule of course comes in a few different flavors. That's because being a basic nitrogen compound makes it suitable to form things called adducts with many acids, resulting in things like hydrazine chloride or sulfate. These chemicals are in general a lot safer than pure hydrazine, and I could theoretically call this project done when I finish making such flavored hydrazine, but since this is amateur chemistry, I decided to go all in and make the hydrazine in its raw form. Making pure anhydrous hydrazine, however, would be quite unwise and too dangerous even for my tastes, so instead I settled on something called hydrazine hydrate. You can think of it as a link between the safer hydrazine adducts and the pure and deadly stuff, and its properties are also kind of in the middle with a good balance of fun and danger. To make it, I will first have to create some flavored hydrazine, preferably in the form of hydrazine sulfate, and even though I plan to do it using bleach and ammonia, there are actually a few other methods. 
They are all, however, well documented and popular, while the bleach ammonia process seems to be quite obscure, and by carrying it out I aim to test how viable it is compared to others. Anyway, to start making some rocket fuel, I first have to prepare my bleach and ammonia in a way that when I later mix them I won't blow myself up, and first I measured out and added 250ml of ammonia into a beaker with magnetic steering. By ammonia I mean a 25% solution of ammonia gas in water, it looks just like any other colorless liquid and has an incredibly strong and irritating smell that makes your eyes feel like they are on fire. With the ammonia ready, I now have to take care of the bleach, and since I can't just add it to my ammonia and magically receive some hydrazine, I have to add something that will make the reaction more selective in making it. This something is a chemical called methyl ethyl ketone, or MEG for short, and I know that its name is kind of scary, but it's actually quite commonly used in things like paint strippers. Chemically, it resembles acetone and has many similar properties, and for a reason that will become clear later, I have to use it to make my rocket fuel. I added 100ml of it into my ammonia, and as you can see the two liquids don't really mix well, with the ketones staying as a suspension even with vigorous steering. Now, before adding in the bleach, I got the whole beaker into a cold water bath which should hopefully improve my yield, and when everything cooled down, I was now ready to begin the reaction. I measured out 125 grams of 15% bleach, or more chemically speaking, an aqueous solution of sodium hypochlorite, which structurally closely resembles table salt, but has this additional oxygen atom that makes it extra angry and powerful enough to react with ammonia. To add my bleach into the reaction beaker, I can't just pour it in all at once, because that would cause a lot of nasty side reactions to happen, so to add it slowly and not lose my sanity along the way, I set up this neat separatory funnel above the reaction beaker and poured all the bleach into it. With everything ready, I lightly opened my funnel's valve, letting small drops of the bleach fall into the methyl ethyl ketone ammonia mixture, and at first glance it didn't really seem that much was happening. On the molecular level, however, several reactions were taking place, the most important of which was the creation of this weird molecule called methyl ethyl ketazine, which consists of two methyl ethyl ketone molecules bonded together through two nitrogen atoms arranged in a way resembling hydrazine. The ketazine formation should be pretty much the only reaction that's happening here, however, even with good steering and cooling, some side reactions are always going to be present. They create the toxic gases I talked about earlier, and setting up this whole apparatus and using a gigantic excess of ammonia should help prevent them, but either way, they are the reason this whole thing must be done in a fume hood. Anyway, after adding in all the bleach, the reaction beaker looked pretty much the same as before, it also heated up quite a bit, now sitting at around 20 degrees Celsius. To proceed, I removed the cold water bath and the funnel, and I could now see some small, slightly yellow droplets floating around in the solution. This is supposed to be my ketazine, which is nearly insoluble in water, and without steering, slowly forms a separate layer on top. I could start processing this mixture now, but since I wanted to get as much yield as I could, I got the beaker of my hot plate and after covering it with some aluminum foil, left it to sit overnight for the layers to fully separate. When I came back in the morning, everything looked much better, with the layers clearly visible, and now I can finish turning this thing into hydrazine. To do that, I first have to separate my ketazine from the depleted ammonia solution, and I can easily do it using just a separatory funnel, which is the sole reason why I used methyl ethyl ketone and not acetone. You see, acetone also forms a ketazine, but it is soluble in water and would be a pain to separate, so while using acetone is possible, methyl ethyl ketone is just much better. Anyway, when I was done separating the layers, I was left with roughly 40ml of methyl ethyl ketazine that's probably mixed with some residual methyl ethyl ketone, but this doesn't really matter for the next step. To turn the ketazine into hydrazine, I have to selectively cleave the newly formed carbon-nitrogen bond, and for this the best thing to use is a strong acid. Since I aim to make hydrazine sulfate, I am going to use some 98% sulfuric acid, and to start I used around 100ml of distilled water to dilute 20ml of it. This is one of the few times I remembered to add acid to water, which is how you should always do it instead of the other way around and that made me really proud of myself. Anyway, with this dilute acid solution ready, it is now time to combine it with my ketazine. 
To do that, I got my ketazine beaker onto a hot plate with stirring and dumped in the whole sulfuric acid solution at once, which I must admit was a little careless, but in the end it didn't really matter. I then started lightly heating everything to make the occurring reactions go faster, and speaking of those, the sulfuric acid catalyzes the hydrolysis of ketazine into free hydrazine and methyl ethyl ketone. The created hydrazine then quickly reacts with the acid, forming hydrazine sulfate, which is left floating around in the solution and is my final product. To increase the yield of this reaction, I turned the heating to around 90 degrees Celsius to boil off all the created methyl ethyl ketone, since it has a relatively low boiling point and if there is enough present it could make the hydrolysis reaction go in reverse, so it's best to remove it as quickly as it forms. Anyway, when all the methyl ethyl ketone boiled away, I was now left with a solution of hydrazine sulfate and some excess sulfuric acid, and to get my product from it I must crystallize it out. This is best done by cooling the mixture so that the hydrazine sulfate has a harder time dissolving and I did that by putting the whole reaction beaker into a fridge overnight. In the morning there was a small layer of beautiful needle-like crystals on the bottom of the beaker and to get rid of the sulfuric acid solution I used my trusty vacuum filter. I then got the moist crystals onto a dish and there was a really small amount of them meaning that this whole process is trash or that I screwed up somewhere which is honestly highly likely. Anyway, it's now time to dry my product and before doing that I noticed that some more crystals of it decided to magically appear in the filtrate. I filtered them out and combined with the rest, which made my yield a bit less terrible. I then dried everything in my lab oven and meanwhile got visited by this really cool lizard I just had to include in this video. Anyway, my final yield of flavored rocket fuel turned out to be a whopping 2.1 grams or 6.5%. This yield is crappy to say the least and I expected at least something like 40% but it seems that the chemistry gods didn't really want to bless me this time. This utter failure of a yield is probably due to the fact that there have been some contaminants in the bleach or it was a lower concentration than advertised. Also, I forgot to add some gelatin to the ammonia that is supposed to really help the ketazin formation which is like a cherry on top of a crap yield cake. Anyway, after making the hydrazine sulfate, I originally wanted to proceed straight to turning it into hydrazine hydrate, but 2 grams of product is just unacceptable even for my standards, so I repeated the whole process 4 more times. This took me like 3 days, and even though I now remembered about the gelatin, the yield improved just marginally, being on average 3 grams, giving me a total of 15 grams of hydrazine sulfate that had to be enough for the next step. Speaking of it, to liberate my hydrazine from its sulfuric acid prison and unleash its full potential, I just have to combine the hydrazine sulfate with some sodium hydroxide and distill off the created liquid hydrazine. To start, I measured out and added 10 grams of sodium hydroxide into my hydrazine sulfate containing flask. They should in theory start immediately reacting, but since there was no water present to dissolve them, they just sat there, which was good in this case since it gave me time to assemble this neat reflex apparatus. It will help contain any stray hydrazine vapors in the flask by condensing them and make this whole process much safer. When everything was ready, I added 30 ml of distilled water through the open end of the condenser, which by allowing the ingredients to dissolve initiated a quite rapid reaction that looked like it might bubble over at any moment and I prayed for it to not do that. Anyway, this reaction is just a simple neutralization that through the interaction of sodium hydroxide and hydrazine sulfate produces hydrazine, sodium sulfate and water. All the added and created water helps tame the extremely flammable and toxic hydrazine and combined with the reflux makes this whole thing relatively manageable. Anyway, even though pretty much everything finished reacting a few minutes after adding the water, I heated this mixture to make it boil for about half an hour to be absolutely sure of the reaction's completion and not accidentally ruin my yield again. When the 30 minutes were up, I was now left with a hot hydrazine solution with a ton of sodium sulfate dissolved into it and to get my hydrazine out I had to carry out a distillation. To do that, I quickly swapped out the reflux for a distillation setup and started heating the flask. This distillation is actually a very simple one, since I don't have to separate any of the vapor's components and just have to heat the boiling flask until all the liquid inside evaporates. 
the hydrazine should distill along with the water since it has a relatively similar boiling point and this really eases this whole procedure since there are pretty much no hydrazine vapors escaping out of the apparatus and a fume hood is more than enough to keep me safe. Anyway, after about 2 hours of heating, the boiling flask got bone dry and there was some crystal clear distillate collected in my receiving flask, which hopefully contained a good bit of hydrazine. Before measuring my yield, I had to first take care of my hydrazine contaminated apparatus, which I couldn't wash in a sink without causing an environmental disaster, so I first needed to neutralize all the leftover hydrazine. This can be easily done by washing everything with some dilute hydrogen peroxide, which easily oxidizes hydrazine to harmless nitrogen gas, which you can see causing a lot of bubbling in the boiling flask. Anyway, with the residual hydrazine neutralized, it's now time to measure the yield of this whole endeavor, and it turns out that I managed to make 24 milliliters or 23.6 grams of some dilute hydrazine hydrate. Hydrazine's concentration in this solution should be about 10% based on the hydrazine sulfate used to make it, which isn't much but makes it tame enough to work with reasonably safely. In theory, I could try concentrating my hydrazine further to really ramp up its reactivity, but I decided against it for this project because I feel that I have potentially exposed myself to enough toxic gases already. Anyway, as the first experiment with my product, I wanted to demonstrate hydrazine's basicity and upon contact with a pH paper you can clearly see that it is quite basic, much like ammonia, and this property makes it suitable to form adducts with various acids. In terms of appearance, it looks just like some innocent water, however, when it comes to its reactivity, it's the opposite of innocent, and the most well-known demonstration of that is its reaction with nitric acid, sometimes used to propel rockets through space. Nitric acid is a very strong oxidizing agent, especially at high concentrations, and here I have some nearly pure nitric acid, which is so strong it fumes in air and will be perfect for this reaction. When I add some of my hydrazine into it, which in turn is an incredibly strong reducing agent, a quite vigorous reaction occurs, which isn't nearly as explosive and useful as a rocket propellant as with pure hydrazine, but even with my dilute stuff, it's still surprisingly fast. You can think of it like the fight between two armed kinds of nitrogen, which are the chemical opposites of one another, and annihilate themselves, creating harmless nitrogen gas. Anyway, hydrazine also reacts quite vigorously with many other oxidizing agents like iodine, potassium permanganate or potassium dichromate, and it also can precipitate silver and copper from the salts, which showcases its main laboratory use as a strong and versatile reducing agent. In the future, I plan to use it for some cool experiments, and for storage I got all of my leftover hydrazine into a teflon tape sealed vial, which will hopefully contain this toxic liquid for a long time. This whole project was quite fun and interesting, and when it comes to my thoughts on this specific way to make hydrazine, I would say that in terms of yield it's quite crappy, but for someone with better quality bleach and a positive blessing from the chemistry gods, it can be quite viable, given how cheap and straightforward it is, especially on a large scale, when you can theoretically recycle most of the methyl ethyl ketone. Anyway, for now I have to thank you all for watching this short project, if you enjoyed it you can like this video, share it with a friend and subscribe to my channel. If you want to further support my work and gain access to exclusive content and suitable for YouTube, as well as having your name displayed at the end of every video, I invite you to join my Patreon. Also, as always, a gigantic thank you goes to all my wonderful Patreon members for their support which allows me to take on all these projects and see you guys in the next video.